Okay, everybody, can you take your seats and we'll get started? All right, today's lecture is on market pull, how to find new opportunities. The objectives for today are to review some different tools about how to find new opportunities. And we're going to look at uh, Peter Drucker had seven opportunity uh, areas or ways to find opportunities. And it's a little bit old in the literature, but I actually think it's still very relevant. So I actually want to want to cover those seven search areas that he highlighted. We'll also talk a little bit about a work by Griffin on finding problems. And we'll talk about journey mapping as a way to find unmet needs. And then finally, uh, we'll talk briefly about ethnographic interviews. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about using a simple framework for evaluating the different possibilities. Okay, so let's take a quick look at problem selection. So typically, when you think about choosing a problem to work on, you can think about a problem as being an unmet need, if you will. Um, oftentimes, you're looking at maximizing profit, impact, and influence, and maximizing your ROI. You're also probably thinking about things like feasibility and risk. Is this something that you or your company can do? How risky is it? Can you tolerate the risk? Um, can you solve the problem? Is it a solvable problem? And uh, like I said, if you, uh, if you really think that you can accept the risks. And so now let's look at where do you find problems to solve? So what I like to do is I like to start with sort of a a cheat sheet for what people pay for. And I think this is simple, easy to understand, and gives you some kind of metrics by which you can test things out. The first one is that people pay to avoid pain. If you think about it, if you get up in the morning and you're sick or you're hurt, everything else for the day stops, you go to the doctor, you rest. It's number one priority. People pay to solve a problem. This is something we think about, you know, we get a job and our employer pays us generally to solve problems for them. Advance, so career or profit. Now, it's interesting that we would pay for a pain first and then we would pay to solve a problem and then advancement would be third. And the reason why I list it as third is because typically we think about improvement as something that's secondary for sustaining. Now, I think we realize in a course on innovation that oftentimes it's the continual reaching that keeps you sustained in a leadership position. And then the final one is increased happiness. And I find this is funny because ultimately, I think in our lives, we're just trying to be happy, right? But I think if you look at where people spend money, um, it's down the list. It's not the first thing they do when they get up in the morning. So let's talk a little bit now about problem value. So uh, Typically in economics and in business, we talk about two types of areas for uh, problems. The first one is in market pull. And so this is when you try to identify a value and then you go in search of a solution or a technology. And the second one is technology push, which was what many engineers and scientists do. We figure out some new widget or some new method and then we go out in search of a need. Today we're going to focus on market pull for two reasons. One is um, that I think it's the one that probably you least have had exposure to. And I also think that it's one of the most important ones because even if you develop a technology, um, if you have a technology and you go out in search of a need, you're really just looking for a market to pull you along. If the market's not pulling you, you've got a real problem. Technology can't literally push. The market has to pull. Um, so we'll talk about technology push, if you will, in some later lectures. All right. So we're going to focus today on market pull. So where do we find problems? Your experience, your environment, both physical and virtual, your business, your vocation. Maybe there's some other areas. Problems are found all around you. And typically, if you find most particularly small businesses, are started from some problem that the uh, founder had or saw that was very close to them. It's unlikely you're going to be working on and looking for problems that aren't in an area that's already very close to you. If it's not within one degree of separation of you, it's probably too far. All right. So let's talk about uh, Drucker and his search areas for opportunities. So he had seven. Uh, the first is the unexpected, incongruities, process weakness, 
industry market structure, demographics, changes in perception, new knowledge, call this invention. And I like to summarize this, all of these are about opportunities come about when there is change. And I think that's pretty obvious, right? And so if you look at what is changing in the market or what's changing around us, anytime there's change, the status quo is old and what's needed is something new. And that's where you can see an opportunity. Uh, one thing Drucker points out is the first four are generally internal to an industry and the last three are external to an industry. And that makes a difference because typically things that are internal to an industry are noticed by people that are already there, already the incumbents. Whereas external to the industry is something that everyone can see. So this is something that I really like. Uh, this was a quote by Isaac Asimov. The most exciting phrase to hear in science the one that heralds new discoveries is not Eureka, but that's funny. If you look at where most scientific breakthroughs come from or most realizations of new problems, it's not through some groundbreaking event. It's usually from just noticing something small and different. Some opportunity, either in learning something new or some opportunity that means new value. So let's get started. So let's get started. The unexpected. So what do we mean by unexpected? So let's take a look at an unexpected success and how that led to an opportunity for innovation. So um, in the 1920s, uh, both Germany and DuPont were doing research in chemical uh, development of new polymers. And both uh, researchers in Germany and in DuPont had had accidents in the lab. And by accidents, I don't mean like an explosion. I mean, for instance, in DuPont, they left uh, uh, a pot with some kind of chemical compound in overnight. And when they came back in the next morning, they found that something had actually formed inside that pot. And it turns out that would, would, what, what would become later known as nylon. Now, the same thing happened in Germany, but when the pot was left over and something formed in the center, they just threw it away and said, who left the pot out? DuPont, on the other hand, saw this as an opportunity. They investigated what happened inside this pot, and they found a new type of polymer that they could use for, as we know, almost everywhere in the world. Another great example is uh, Matsushita, which I think later became Panasonic. When the television was first invented and introduced in Japan, it was thought of as sort of a, um, uh, a rich person's uh, uh, um, object to have. So this is something the rich would have. It was a brand new electronic gadget. And farmers, for instance, wouldn't have any interest or capability to buy a TV. And so most of the major television companies actually stayed away from regular people, in particular farmers. But Panasonic actually went around and sold door-to-door -door televisions to farmers. And they found that what uh, the other companies had missed was the fact that while it doesn't seem like a farmer would want a luxury good like a television, what a farmer does want is a farmer wants to have contact with the outside world, to have broader experiences because they're not able to travel at least at this time in the mid-50s. And so this was a uh, sudden unexpected success for Panasonic when they went around selling door-to-door -door that the farmers actually wanted television. Uh, another example of the unexpected is an unexpected failure. And so I really like this example. So um, you've probably heard of the Ford Edsel. It's sort of used as the quintessential example of a failed product. Now, I didn't grow up when the Edsel was around. I think probably my parents did. Uh, I've never seen one. You probably haven't one either, but you probably have heard the word. And the Ford Edsel was actually their solution to a problem. And so in the 1920s, uh, Sloan had developed a socioeconomic segmentation for car brands. So they had set up the low, mid, upper middle, and upper class of cars, and that's where all the brands came about in GM. 
And Ford had the same. They had organized it in Continental as being the top brand. Edsel was going to be the upper middle class. It was a piece they didn't have. Mercury was the mid. They already had that in place. And then Ford was the entry level or the basic car. And so their idea was is they were going to introduce the Edsel to bridge the gap between the Mercury and the Continental. And when they launched it with huge fanfare, it was a complete failure. So what do you think they would do? They would go back and try to build another car? Well, no. What they did is they said, remember, we're looking for these, these little things that say, that's, that's funny. And what Ford looked at was, why was it a failure? What had they missed? Because in that failure, they realized that their perception of the market was wrong. And this was an opportunity to try to figure out what was right. And what was their response? Their response was to develop the Ford Thunderbird. Because they realized that people didn't want a bridge between Mercury and Continental. That upper middle class, they wanted something more of a sports car, a lifestyle segment. And that's when they introduced the Ford Thunderbird. And you've probably heard of the Ford Thunderbird, but you probably didn't know, and I didn't know until I did a little bit of research, but it's the most successful car since Ford's Model T. I think it spanned 40 or 50 years of continual uh, Thunderbirds being available, all from noticing a failure that they hadn't anticipated. All right. So here's a, another uh, unexpected change, and this has to do with IBM and the PC computer. It's interesting because um, when, you, uh, when we covered disruptive innovation and we talked about how uh, IBM led the initial disk drive industry and then was basically, um, I will not say run out of town, but the industry became dominated by startups, it sort of paints this picture of maybe IBM wasn't innovative, wasn't quick to react. And we also uh, think about IBM and the PC computer. We hear the stories of Bill Gates and IBM sort of missed the boat, if you will. Well, it turns out actually they didn't miss the boat as much as, as you might have thought. So IBM's plan in the 70s was as computing was expanding was they were going to basically install terminals in everybody's office. And those terminals would talk to a mainframe. And if you read the book Outliers, Malcolm Gladwell describes uh, Bill Gates when he was young, logging onto a terminal that was uh, linked to a mainframe. And this was their idea because it was the most efficient way of using computing resources. But, well, unfortunately or fortunately, that's not what actually panned out. In the late 70s, people actually just wanted a computer locally. They wanted a personal computer. And this was something that IBM hadn't quite realized that was going to be that important. And so in 1977, when the PC market was just 200 million, about a decade later it would be 15, or 15 billion, IBM formed a task force to see what went wrong, what was wrong with their thinking on the terminal, and how could they enter the PC market. And in 1980, IBM introduced their first PC. Okay, well that's great, they were late to the game, but they jumped in. Here's the kicker. In 1983, IBM was the world's leading PC maker. That's pretty impressive. They started out with a plan. They saw that the market changed drastically from what they thought it was, but they were able to jump back in and use that to their advantage. I want to ask you, though, before we leave this slide, um, why do you think IBM didn't lead then forever with the PC market? I think they get a bad rap as maybe not being innovative or not following up. I think one of the reasons that people don't quite realize is IBM is very strategic and they choose what markets they want to play in and also what markets they don't want to play in. IBM has never been a commodity consumer electronics market. That doesn't mean they couldn't survive there. But as the PC became a commodity, it became less interesting to IBM. They were focusing on the business segment. And so that's when they focused on business computing and later through the 80s and 90s actually moved into services. So I don't think IBM was uh, run out of town, if you will. I think they, they made some very strategic choices. Um, and they did miss a big market, but I don't think they were going after that market, in my, in my opinion. All right, so the unexpected. Established firms who ignore change are often disrupted by those who did not ignore it. Emerging opportunities exist when the market majority misses a change that signals a new market opportunity. 
And I think this could be said anywhere. When the main part of the market doesn't see the change, but you do, that's an excellent opportunity. Established firms often see changes uh, than uh, startups because they have a wider view of the market. So um, I think you could basically talk either side of this, that because you're an individual, you may have a unique perspective and you see something the larger firms don't. But on the flip side is that major trends incumbents tend to see first because they're looking at a broader scale. And I think I just mentioned that on the previous point. So I think in summary, the unexpected simply means change. And as I said before, change means opportunity. Okay. So the next point, incongruity, I call these uh, pain points. Um, one example that's uh, cited often in innovation and economics is uh, steel mills. And basically, the short version of the story is a steel mill is really, really efficient when it's at max capacity. So in wartime, they do great. They're very efficient. But if you're not at max capacity, it turns out they're very inefficient uh, for several reasons. One is that they tend to uh, heat and cool the steel in multiple stages. And the problem with that is if you've, you know, basic physics is it consumes energy every time you heat it up and if you cool it, you lose that energy. So what people realized is, is, is that if they could make a dedicated steel mill, what they call mini mills, that would make specific products, they could operate that at high capacity. And also they had several innovations where they could actually keep the metal hot because it was a single processing step for a single product. And so the mini mills basically took on the incongruous economy of the, uh, the large steel mills. Uh, another one is uh, an incongruity between reality and assumptions. Uh, this is uh, an age-old example of ocean freighters. You've probably seen examples. I think every maritime museum has a little demo on loading cargo ships. Well, now I think, I don't know if you knew it, but it takes about 24 to 48 hours to load an entire cargo ship. Well, before they invented all the cranes and the systematic packing of boxes, so basically the uh, trucks can load the, uh, uh, the boxes straight to the, the dock, the uh, cranes can put them right on the ship, and there's nothing has to be handled other than lifting up and putting it on. Before they did that, they were thinking about managing costs of shipping. And they were doing that by making the ships more efficient for fuel, also making them require less crew, so the overall expenses were lower. But the part they missed was is that, and it's actually quite obvious, is the largest expense of any shipping operation is the interest on the ship. And so what you have to do is you have to amortize that interest cost over the largest number you possibly can. So while fuel efficiency and small crews are great, they really don't address the real issue, and that was the interest on the ship. Uh, here's another one, incongruity between perceived customer value and the true value. I mentioned this before. People didn't think farmers would want televisions. But in fact, they were some of the prime people to want televisions because they wanted to see more of the world, to experience more of the world. Um, and this final one, incongruity in rhythm or process. Uh, uh, I like this story. This is Scott. Uh, I don't know if any of you have houses up here in Boston. Even if you do, you probably have a very small yard. But... Um, if you have a yard and you seed it regularly, you've seen the people out with the little things, they push the little seeders, they'll put on a, a fertilizer and put down seed. Well, it turns out, I'm not exactly sure when this was, but when Scott and company was starting out, everybody sold this advanced seed and these advanced fertilizers. But really the problem was, the incongruity was high-tech seed and fertilizer and some dumb guy like myself on the weekend saying, what do I do with this? And so Scott introduced one of those push dispensers that has a little knob with numbers and it matches the product you buy from Scott. So I don't have to know anything about the product. All I have to do is look at the bag. It says knob the four. I set it to four and I go. And so that was a great solution. Today Scott's one of the top companies, particularly in home, um, in home uh, uh, lawn care. All right, so let's move on. Um, the next one is process needs. And, I call these keystone problems, and you've heard me talk about them before. These are the problems that sort of separate uh, a need or a value that we know about in the current situation where we are. Oftentimes it's a technology or an invention or something that's needed that forms the gap, that bridges sort of the basic understanding of the need with uh, the current state of technology. Um, 
And so uh, Drucker points out that uh, for process need, he focuses it on the task, not the situation. Um, and as I said before, I call these keystone problems. And let's just look at a couple examples. Um, this is one that's home to us here at Harvard. Uh, so if you know, we're in the uh, Gordon McKay uh, endowed uh, cease. And so the original endowment was for $5 million. And that's actually what founded the school, actually the division of engineering and applied science, which is now the School of Engineering and Applied Science. And it was endowed on a $5 million uh, gift that he gave Harvard. And just a little aside, if you didn't know it, uh, back in 1905, or shortly thereafter, um, instead of actually building a school, uh, Harvard actually went to MIT and tried to buy MIT. It's, it's not a joke. They went to buy MIT. And they actually got pretty far. The faculty were against it, but uh, there was a big push. It made sense, the strong liberal arts uh, college, a technical college, to join them. And um, if you go over to MIT, the library, they actually have the little voting cards for where the vote uh, happened with the faculty to vote yay or nay. And uh, from my understanding, in the end, uh, it didn't go through not because the faculty were against it, although most were. Uh, it was because I believe a piece of MIT was part of a land grant and couldn't be bought by a private institution. So anyway, a little bit of background. But so where did Gordon McKay get his money? He got it from this. So uh, prior to uh, the Civil War, the way you made a shoe is you would sew the uppers, and then you'd take the sole, and then you'd hand stitch that upper onto the sole. And the most time consuming process of making a shoe was getting that upper onto the sole. And so that really limited the number of shoes you could make. And uh, Gordon McKay got together with a gentleman uh, by the name of Blakes, and he invented a machine that would sew on in one step the upper onto the sole of a shoe. Totally transformed how shoes were made. And with this invention, Gordon McKay became one of the number one shoe producers in the world, right here in the suburbs of Boston. And with the money he earned from that, he founded the school you're sitting in. Another great example is Eastman Kodak. Um, in the early days of photography, you actually had glass plates that were very sensitive, they were heavy, and they broke. And Kodak figured out a way that instead of using uh, the plates, a cellulose film he could do the same chemistry on. It was light, it was robust, it didn't, uh, it didn't break easily, and it totally transformed how we did uh, photography. So both of those were known problems, looking for a specific solution or a keystone problem that was solved. All right. Um, the next one is industry and market structure change. So high growth causes uh, industry and market structures to change uh, and new opportunities arise. Uh, one great example of this was in the 1960s. Prior to the 1960s, everybody basically, um, if you lived in France, you bought a French automobile. If you lived in Italy, you bought an Italian automobile. And uh, in the 1960s is when automobile companies, namely Japan, uh, started having the idea of exporting their automobiles. So Volkswagen did a great job of this and so did the Japanese. And a lot of companies uh, went out of business and a lot of companies became disrupted because they didn't miss this idea that you could globalize car production. It just wasn't in the mindset at the time. Uh, another example, um, you probably don't remember MCI and Sprint. You probably think of Sprint now as the cell phone carrier. Uh, back in the day when I was a wee little lad, um, it used to cost a lot of money to call long distance. And what the phone companies would do is they would charge a lot of money for an individual to call long distances. But if a business was going to buy up a whole bunch of minutes, thousands or tens of thousands of minutes, the rates were drastically reduced. And so what happened is a company, MCI and Sprint, actually came in and realized we can just buy these tens of thousands of minutes and resell them to uh, the individual consumer at a much better rate. And so 20, 30 years ago, you actually had your basic phone service, and then you paid for your long distance service. And this really was an innovation because before it was very expensive to call. And with MCI and Sprint, um, they introduced one of the first things where you could call after nine for free, long distance. It was never heard of. Um, one little comment here, newcomers or startups uh, can often leverage a market change that large incumbents find difficult. Uh, so throughout this, you'll notice that sort of the big companies and the new co's have different advantages here. 
but when there's a change, you're not grounded in what uh, your industry and your company's been doing, and sometimes that uh, is an asset. Okay, great. Changes in demographics. Uh, JP Morgan was a, a good example. So Rothschild in the UK was the leading bank, and this was in the late 1800s. The US was growing, but they never really saw that the financial capital of the world, if you will, would ever transfer away from the UK. And so J.P. Morgan started a securities and banking in the U.S. to tailor to U.S. investors. And as you know, uh, they cleaned up pretty well. Another one that's pretty interesting, it's just because of how people missed it. I always find stories of when people looked at a problem, found an answer, and then later realized it was completely wrong. And I sort of always want to think about, you know, why is it? What did they miss? And so 1961, JFK formed an alliance for progress with Latin America. And one of the outcomes of them, of the study and the alliance was they all assumed that the population growth in Latin America would stay about the same. It's not constant, but the rate of increase would stay the same. And that the industry that people engaged in, which was predominantly farming, would all stay the same. What they didn't realize was that with modern medicines, birth defects would go down and infant mortality would go drastically down. And so the birth rate would actually go up, or the birth rate um, uh, the population would increase much faster. And also it was natural that urbanization would occur. And so what happened is they had more people and more people moved into the city. And Sears actually went down and visited several of the capitals down in Latin America. And he saw this ingress of, of people, of farmers coming in to an urban area. And he realized what they needed was a department store. And he did very well in Latin America because he saw that. And the final one is uh, Citibank. Uh, this was interesting. So in 1972, the forecast was that women in the workforce would decline. Now, you, if you think about it a little bit or if you heard about it, uh, during World War II, many of the men went overseas to fight and women in the workforce really uh, exploded. And the idea was is that slowly was going to go back to pre-war numbers. And so in 1972, the forecasts were all right, we're going we're gonna to slowly decline from this high number. Well, in 1982, 64% of the labor force was women. And what Citibank realized was that there was this large untapped pool that they could pull in. And Citibank pulled in predominantly a female workforce uh, for their sales and uh, um, uh, customer management and did extremely well because of seeing that this was actually a uh, uh, an increasing uh, area in the demographics. All right. Okay, uh, the last one, changes in perception. Um, I see this all the time, the green effort, uh, uh, the health market. Uh, if you haven't seen Whole Foods, there's a great example. Whole Foods and a lot of these organic stores weren't around before. Um, we all have now low energy devices. Parts to save money, but parts also for many people is a green effort. Uh, and there's also lifestyle goods. But these are, are, are examples of where our perception of where value is has changed because of, uh, of either internal changes or in cultural changes. All right, new knowledge. I think this is an interesting one because here at uh, an engineering and science school, we think about invention as being the heart of innovation. And so I'll start with the lead off point. Invention is not innovation. And so Drucker put out that there were three requirements for innovation, uh, our invention here. Careful analysis of all the factors, a strategic position, and entrepreneurial management. If you look at those, none of those have to do with the technology. And he listed some great examples, and this is why I, uh, I like to use these. Uh, so let's look at some examples of where new knowledge created uh, innovation. Um, so Edison, so we all think Ben was a great inventor. Well, it turns out Swan over in England actually built a better light bulb than Edison did. But what Edison had was a place to put the light bulb. He'd already envisioned a city with electricity and lighting it up. And so he had a market perspective and knew exactly what to do with the light bulb, even though it wasn't as good as Swan's. Um, the Wright brothers, this is uh, another great example. And everyone talks about the Wright brothers. They were bicycle uh, manufacturers. And, um, uh, Langley, um, it was running uh, at the Smithsonian, actually had the big government grant, all the expertise. Everything was in his favor. Um, but it was the Wright brothers who realized the, uh, the key aspect 
of what was there. Edison. Pfizer is a great example. So Pfizer's uh, claim to fame or their starting point was penicillin. But Pfizer didn't, they didn't invent penicillin. It was invented, I think, over in Oxford. What Pfizer did was realize that the real problem wasn't in the invention of penicillin, it was figuring out a way to synthesize it in mass quantities. And that's what they focused on. So it wasn't the inventor of penicillin that captured the market, but it was the one who had the entrepreneurial management and the realization of what was needed to meet the market needs. And diesel's another great example. Um, diesel invented, obviously, the diesel engine, but nobody was really interested in the engine. He didn't make any money or any significant money off it. It was the companies who took the idea and turned it into products that added value into the market that captured where the value is from. And the final one is Boeing. I like this story because um, uh, we all know Boeing is an airplane manufacturer. Uh, what you may not know is that uh, de Havilland actually, I believe, invented the jet passenger plane. But the problem was is they didn't know how to build a business out of it. Boeing, what Boeing did is they took technology that wasn't really their original invention and this idea of a passenger plane, a jet passenger plane, and they realized what was needed to make it into a business reality. And Drucker's point on all of these is simply that just having that invention isn't enough. You have to translate that invention into a market solution. And that requires a lot more than simply inventing. All right, three focuses for knowledge base uh, innovation, or this is invention. Um, one is focusing on a complete system. So both Edwin Land and Polaroid, if you don't know this, uh, uh, this story, uh, Edwin Land invented uh, um, the Polaroid camera, and it was a camera that did everything, right? Took your picture, developed the film. Uh, market focus, uh, DuPont knew what to do with nylon. They capitalized on this accident in the lab and knew what to do. Uh, in strategic position, Pfizer knew what needed to be done with penicillin. Um, and the last thought that I think is interesting because it's counter to what many of us as innovators, uh, particularly in the technology segment, think of. So Drucker's view on the bright idea is that it's an anomaly and it's not a source for systematic innovation. So I'll just leave you that with your, with your thoughts on that. All right, so let's go on and talk about uh, some other methodologies for problem finding. And uh, so this is from a paper by Griffin uh, in 2012, uh, finding the best problems to solve. And so he has uh, four needs spotting is what he calls. Uh, the first method is seek uh, next performance improvement. So uh, here's an example of a phone case. Uh, now you have a phone case with charging capacity. So you take what's there, you take it to the next level. Uh, reframing existing problems. So an example shown here is, uh, so you know when you have a paint brush and you have paint on it, you have this globby paint that spreads everywhere, drops everywhere, and um, uh, one solution is actually to think about it as a pump and to pump the paint into the brush as needed. Uh, the third is work backwards on a future vision. So e-ink wasn't the final solution to a paperless world, but that's sort of where sort of the original vision starts, right? How do I get rid of paper? And they work back to, well, I can't get rid of paper, but I can give you something that's certainly different and better than what you have today. Um, and here's uh, use other domains for insight, seeing what problems are being addressed uh, from a cross discipline. Uh, this is an example of uh, uh, candy made in as toys. So pretty cool. All right. Um, where can you find these problems? We talked about it as kind of first degree of freedom around you. Uh, use your networks of contacts. Uh, perform first-hand research. I think this is obvious, but um, most of the unique problems you're gonna find are problems that you have, that you personally experience. And they're also gonna be the ones that you're gonna be able to develop because you can experiment and work with them firsthand. It's very hard to walk into a company and not have any um, 
any relationship to what their business is, sit down with them and try to pull out a unique need. Can be done, but it's, it's challenging. You find it easier when it's uh, closer to home. Um, so some ways to uh, determining user needs. Um, so the D School at Stanford actually has several uh, resources that I think are good. Uh, journey mapping, which we'll talk in a minute, ethnographic interview. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit these more, um, but there's actually several, um, uh, several kind of methodologies out there to kind of help you walk through the process. Um, I think that just walking through the process the first time, you may not get it. But I think if you walk through the process and suddenly find a need you didn't see before, that's when you really start to pick up on the essence of these unmet and unseen needs. I think this is sort of a theme that we've been talking about today is you not only need to find an unmet need, but it needs to be unseen. And we'll talk at the very end. There's a lot of unmet needs out there that uh, big companies see and take care of right away. And it's hard to start up a new idea based upon those. Um, so a journey map. Uh, so a journey map is basically looking at a process or something that an individual or a company does and then just walking through it. Walking through the journey and trying to figure out where the challenges are. What are the bottlenecks? This could be just walking through a factory. Uh, in this case, uh, they're actually walking through cooking dinner. And um, what they try to do is you can kind of see here in the, uh, the little uh, bubbles here, we'll look a little bit closer here, is that you want to point out where the pain points are. So they looked at uh, there being four stages, preparation, cooking, rewarding, finishing. Um, and they identified pain points, uh, inventories uncertain, disposal of prep mess, solo cooking lonely, dishwasher too much for one and so on. So through here you can find opportunities just by walking through the process. And uh, you can see this a little bit better. This is the sources down here on the right. And um, so here's an example of a pain point. I don't mind the cooking part at all, but I hate the cleaning part. So you can sort of think about this as a, um, um, uh, a market study, if you will. But here you're actually walking through the process. You sometimes see people pull together groups and do market research by asking them questions. It's different, though, when you walk through it. And the reason is, is that if I'm doing a, a market focus group, if you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, oftentimes marketing companies will get uh, 10 or 15 people in the demographic that they think are interested in products, pull them together and start asking them questions about their needs and their wants. And from that, they hope to discern uh, what a new product might be. There's a couple problems with that. One is, is that you're relying on your customers to tell you what they need. And there's two issues with that. The first is, is they're probably not very good at it. And if they're telling you, they're telling everyone. And so it's not, you're not finding an unmet, unseen need. You're basically just finding an unmet need. And one of the greatest examples that I like um, when I was uh, studying for my MBA, uh, they did a case study on Levi's. And there was a period of time where Levi's was going to move from sort of the everyday uh, genre into uh, higher end wear. So they wanted to have a, if you will, a continental going back to the Ford model of Levi's. And they pulled together a focus group and asking them all the things they disliked about uh, Levi's and all the things they liked about um, uh, higher end clothing. And they misread them completely. And they went out and said, these guys really want this. And uh, they never actually stopped to do trials, to walk through the process and see firsthand if this really was going to work. And it, obviously, it was a complete failure. There are no Levi's three-piece suits, um, at least not uh, that I know of today. So going through the journey gives you that opportunity to experience the problems and see something maybe that someone else hasn't. Um, another method uh, is an ethnographic interview, and this is basically uh, going out and talking to people to trying to find their needs. Now, I just said the market focus group wasn't uh, as great as doing a journey, and in my opinion, it's not. But that doesn't mean going out and talking to people doesn't, uh, doesn't give you an opportunity to gain some insight. Um, so part of the methodology is uh, you know, do four to six interviews, um, Try to do it at a place of use. One of the problems with market with focus groups is they often do it in a, a room that they've rented. What you really like to do is go to the place. Go to the factory line, walk around, ask them what the problem is. Um, 
And so uh, the D schools got some guidance on how to prepare for this. Uh, and I think one of the key thing is, I like this, to interview for empathy. And really, you're doing this interview to try to understand what they need, what is value to them. And from that, you may have some opportunities. And at the end, you're trying to get a clearly defined need statement. Um, I'll mention this a little bit later, but uh, um, Steve Jobs was asked where he did his marketing for the iPad. And his response was, uh, it's not our customers' jobs to know what it is they need or want. And I always like that quote because it really gets crystal clear on for the innovator. Part of your job is to find the needs that your customers or the market doesn't know they need. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end. All right, so I want to talk a little bit, now that we've talked about some methodologies for needs here, I want to talk a little bit about uh, evaluating businesses. And this is from uh, Linda Applegate across the river at the business school. Um, and so we've got uh, an opportunity, small and large, and we've got execution, hard and easy. Um, and so let's just look at some examples of a uh, small and easy business. Uh, these are called lifestyle businesses. So this might be owning uh, a couple subway franchises, maybe a hardware store, maybe you're a doctor, you have a practice or you're a lawyer. Uh, this is really a business that makes whatever amount of money that you feel you need and pretty much just operates. It's small, but it's self-contained. It provides the value that you need. Um, execution that's easy and large is a high growth area. It's pretty obvious that we'd all love to be in this easy and large area. And we'll talk a minute why most of us are not going to be there. But then we have this segment that is a, a large opportunity, but it's hard. And so we can call this disruptive, but this is where a lot of technology innovations come from, uh, where uh, there's something that's very hard to do and we find a way to do it, and suddenly we have it open to a large one. And uh, the last one um, that I like uh, Professor Applegate uses for an opportunity that's both hard and small, uh, she calls a dumb idea. And uh, uh, it's kind of funny, but we'll look in a second that there are examples of hard and small businesses that uh, are viable and take place. So let's just look at some examples. Um, for easy and small, uh, cleaner, subway, I'll give you an example. For large and easy, Google, Amazon, Yahoo. If you come up with another, uh, if Amazon comes up with a widget, I don't know what it is, whatever it is, some new widget that they want to sell. Within minutes, it can be online and selling to millions of people. So if something's really easy and all it is is just getting it out to people, Amazon and Google will just dominate. It's very unlikely that you'll come up with something that's really easy, that there's a huge demand for, that you can suddenly move. A lot of times, uh, easy and large has to do with the channels, how you're able to get goods out. Uh, an example of uh, 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 hard and large is rapid gene sequencing. Uh, Professor Boyce and Waits have been talking about that throughout the course. And recycling was an example given for something that's hard and small opportunity. There's not a lot of uh, money to be made in recycling, mainly because it doesn't produce a natural profit. Except for aluminum recycling, uh, there is no recycling that really produces an economic win that would motivate new companies to start. All right. So that might seem kind of obvious, but what I want to what I want to have you think about is this idea, we all want to be in the upper right corner. That's where we'd like to be, but I said that's where, that's where the, big, the big boys are, if you will. And we've got to start some other place. Well, the key is for you to find an emerging need that's initially small but growing. And so by the time it moves into a larger opportunity, you're already there. You're already one of the dominant people. The other one is if you find an opportunity that's large but it's hard to execute, Innovation, or say invention and IP, can be what takes you from the hard into the easy. So I want to sort of leave you with this thought that you always want to be in the upper right, but sometimes you're the only person who can get there. And if you think about it that way, I think you really kind of get into the, uh, the mindset of uh, finding a way that is unique and enabling you to move into a market area that will uh, drive uh, large growth. All right, so I want to leave you with some final thoughts here. Um, market poll or need finding. Uh, sometimes it's more difficult, uh, uh, it's more difficult than uh, technology push uh, as you have to find and develop the problem. 
and maybe this is just because my backgrounds in science and engineering, but oftentimes the problem's well-defined and we just have to figure out a solution. Maybe really hard, but we have a problem. When you're finding market needs, one of the biggest challenges that I find is, is, is that the problem is ill-defined. You don't know what it is. And I think that is the real challenge that makes market pull and need finding difficult. Um, as I mentioned before, every good business has a market pull. There is no technology push. There's only market pull. If you have a technology, it's not you're trying to push it. You're trying to find a market that will pull it. Okay? It's sort of like a wet noodle. You're never going to push it. You can only pull it. And this is as I just mentioned. Um, innovation happens when unrealized need is discovered. And we've talked about this in journey mapping and in Drucker's seven areas of opportunities. Uh, here's a great example, the iPad. I gave you the quote from Steve Jobs earlier. People didn't really know they needed an iPad until it came along. Uh, Twitter, um, I never knew I needed to tweet until Twitter was here. I never knew we, we needed Facebook until it was around. Um, and this is an oldie but a goodie a TV dinner. Uh, there was a time, uh, uh, well, well, first, before microwaves when you actually had to make your dinner in the oven. Um, but uh, TV dinners were an innovation. People didn't realize that the American family really wanted to sit in front of the TV because that was the new pastime for, uh, for families. And so that's uh, just some examples of where you, people was an unrealized need that somebody saw and fulfilled. All right. Uh, I'll be staying around if you have any questions or feel free to email me. Um, thank you very much.